Welcome to Westminster Abbey and to this Abbott Lecture. Uh, my name's David Hoyle. I'm Dean here in the Abbey. The lecture is named for Eric Symes Abbott, who was Dean of Westminster himself uh, from 1959 uh, until 1974. Uh, in a distinguished ministry, he also served as Dean at King's College London and Warden of Keble College, Oxford. Uh, he died in 1983, uh, and just to concentrate the mind, uh, he's actually buried just here. Uh, Abbott was a man much loved and admired as a friend and wise counsellor, and his friends set up this annual lecture on spirituality, uh, which was first delivered in 1986. The lecture is repeated each year at Keble College. I just need uh, personally to note that a significant amount of the work that makes all this possible is done at King's, and I'm deeply grateful to Ellen and to Claire for all they've done to make this year's lecture possible. In the Abbey, it won't surprise you to hear that we're reflecting on the experience of coronation. Uh, that was a moment when nation and commonwealth were expected to celebrate a shared inheritance we spoke about a coronation uh, that involved things like loyalty and belonging. Even a quick glance around this extraordinary building, however, raises questions about the assumptions buried in our long history, careless assumptions about how we define and describe who belongs in community. Here, and previously when I was Dean of Bristol, I have learned pretty quickly and pretty steeply that I need to think more critically and listen a lot more carefully. I'm really delighted to welcome tonight a man supremely equipped uh, to guide and inform me and all of us. Professor Anthony Reddy is director of the Oxford Centre for Religion and Culture. In books and in teaching, he has years of proven experience examining our sense of community through a theological lens. A fairly recent book asks, is God colorblind? He's editor of the journal Black Theology and was one of the recipients of the Lanfranc Award from the Archbishop of Canterbury in recognition of his exceptional and sustained contribution to black theology in Britain and beyond. He'll speak tonight on the theme from black theology to black lives matter and back again. Please welcome Professor Reddy. My name is Anthony George Reddy, and I am a descendant of enslaved Africans. I'm proud of my name. I'm proud to be called Reddy. That's my father's name. But Reddy is not an African name, but it's a Scottish one. So this is a constant and a poignant reminder that at some point in British history, a white Scottish person legally owned and controlled one of my ancestors to the point of giving him or her their name. Ready. This lecture seeks to reflect on the seeming casual phenomena of diaspora and Africans carrying names that speak to our sense of non-being and being as problematic bodies in history. So the long struggle to end the monstrous institution that was the transatlantic slave trade had long been predicated on the belief that sentient human beings, the black bodies of enslaved Africans, could not and should not be treated as objects, as chattel, as commodified things as opposed to human subjects. The famed black British historian David, David Olasaga, he demonstrates the, in, the, indefa the indefatigable work of white abolitionists such as William Wilberforce and Granville Sharp and Thomas Clarkson, all argued using Christian theology as their base that people created in the image and likeness of God should not be treated as commodified subjects. Richard Reddy, 
who's also my brother, he amplifies his point when he says the following, and I quote, Quakers were one of the first groups to argue that Africans were made in the image of God and were part of God's creation and inheritors of the spiritual and material freedoms won for them by Jesus Christ's sacrificial death. They questioned how, if an African could become a Christian, how then a fellow Christian who was made in the same image could exploit or brutalize that individual. And yet, in 1833, when the British government sanctioned the end of chattel slavery, abolitionists such as Wilberforce and others had to concede to a brutal fact of real policy, namely that enslaved Africans were indeed chattel for whom a price could be calculated and for whom a debt needed to be paid in order for them to be redeemed. That price was calculated at 20 million pounds. The abolitionists against the transatlantic slave trade recognised that there was simply too much capital tied up in black bodies for white hegemony to sanction their release without due financial recompense. The famed African-American womanist theologian Kelly Brown Douglas in her magisterial book, Stand Your Ground, she outlines the incipient belief in the sense of the sovereignty of white Anglo-Saxon defense of property and land, often enshrined in the popular aphorism, an English man's home is his castle. I.e., central to the rights of being white and Anglo-Saxon was the inalienable belief that land and commodity that had been accrued by its owner could not and should not be removed or they be deprived of its pleasures without due process under the law. Black bodies, by definition of not being white and not considered to be sentient beings, could not expect any such protection under the law. Laws and customs created by white people for the benefit of white people. Now, to be clear, I'm not questioning the ethics of the abolitionists in accepting the bitter price of paying compensation to white slave owners, a good number of whom were white clergymen, in order to affect a semblance of freedom for enslaved Africans. Clearly, this was a dubious deal done under the rubrics of pragmatism and real polity. Rather, the issue at hand is the precedent it sets for the continued belief that black bodies are commodified, that lack any substantive ontological value when viewed through the lens of white hegemony and entitlement. Our bodies are still seen as things that can be equated with commodity and with property. One quick example may suffice at this juncture in the lecture in order to amplify this point. In the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd in May 2020, I was interviewed on Radio 5 Live to comment on his death. The day before the scheduled interview, looting and vandalism had broken out in several cities in the US as predominantly African Americans vented their fury at the outrage of yet another senseless death of a black person at the hands of a militarized police. Across the world, people were scandalized by the death. Yet as I was being interviewed, one of the things that quickly struck me was how quickly the interviewer was able to link George Floyd's death with that of property. I was asked repeatedly if I would comment on the looting and vandalism that had happened. And I refused to comment. Now, to be clear, I was not condoning what they were doing. But like Martin Luther King, I do believe that riots are the language of the unheard. But what struck me was how easily the interviewer could link property with a black person's life, as if there was an equation between the two.
We still link property and commodity with black people's lives as if somehow there was no intrinsic value in a black life in itself that should be incalculable. So ditto in terms of later that year, the putting down of the Edward Colson statue in Bristol. And again, what one heard very quickly was a concern at the desecration of property. All the while, the fact that so many black people in that city had lived with the egregious insult of a statue built in honour of a slave trader that somehow was whitewashed because he was a great philanthropist who had given lots of money to build schools and a concert hall and various things across the city. So let's imagine for a moment a statue to a Nazi sympathiser, standing erect and proud in a place of prominence. And the excuse for that statue still being there is because this Nazi sympathiser had given away millions of pounds in philanthropy, erecting schools and concert halls, more property. And this would make his egregious actions as a colluded with terror and human misery somehow more acceptable. Can we imagine that ever happening? Yet it happened to black people for well over a century in the city of Bristol because the truth is an offence against black bodies is, was for many no offence at all. So the Black Lives Matter movement emerged in order to counter the patently obvious fact that black lives do not matter. If they did matter, then we wouldn't need a movement to assert what should be blindingly obvious to any rational human being, namely that all lives matter by virtue of being a human being. You therefore, as a human being, have intrinsic and innate value. You matter simply because you are human. And yet even the seemingly innocuous and necessary absurdity of having to argue for Black Lives Matter demonstrates the absurdity of black life in and of itself. That to be black and a human being should matter without the need for a movement to assert it. But even this innocuous and necessary absurdity has been challenged by the parasitical and often racist reactionary counter movement of all lives matter. Funny how all lives didn't matter until black people began to assert that they had a right not to be killed as mere chattelite objects under the strictures of white hegemony. So all lives matter becomes a repudiation of the attempt by black people to seek agency and self-determination, factors that were inimical to their existence when money changed hands, colossal amounts of money, to supposedly set black people free in 1833. When the negotiations for this transaction were taking place, black people were not involved. We were objects over which bartering took place to determine our fates without any recourse being made to our human subjectivity and our sense of self-determination. So when the contemporary Black Lives Matter movement initiated in the United States in July 2013 in the wake of the killing of Trayvon Martin, it was but the latest iteration of a long black liberation struggle that had been centuries in the making. Black Lives Matter is but the latest in a long line of determined black liberationist efforts to assert the ontological value of black bodies as sentient beings imbued with intrinsic value. In the next section, I want to do some historical reflections on the problematic nature of black bodies. One of the fundamental issues with which the Black Lives Matter movement has addressed itself is the problematic nature mission Christianity has had on the nature and existence of black bodies. In using the term mission Christianity, I'm speaking of a historic phenomena in which there existed and continues to this day an interpenetrating relationship between European expansion 
notions of white superiority and the material artifact of the apparatus of empire. This form of Christianity became the conduit for the expansion of Eurocentric models of Christianity in which ethnocentric notions of whiteness gave rise to notions of superiority, manifest destiny and entitlement. Essentially the white man's burden. A central feature of Muslim Christianity was its construction of the black body as other. Anthony Pinn, a well-known African-American black liberation theologian, working through the lens of humanism, has, de has detailed very important work that looks at the dialectic of the existential material, material realities of black bodies and the phenomena that is Christianity. In his magisterial book, Terror and Triumph, Pin rehearses the contested and troubled relationship between white slaveholding Christianity and black bodies, outlining the levels of demonization and virulent denigration that provided the essential backdrop to transatlantic chattel slavery. He outlines the apparent ease and the complicity with which Christianity colluded with the intellectual frameworks that underpinned the machinery of slavery. Pin says, and I quote, in short, scripture required that English Christians began their thinking on Africans with an understanding that Africans had the same creator as themselves. Yet they were at least physically and culturally different and this difference had to be accounted for. As we shall see, a shared sense of creation did not prohibit a ranking within the social order one in which Africans were much lower than Europeans, end of quote. This sense of a deep prevailing anti-black sentiment has been built within mission Christianity and often takes its, as its point of departure the struggle Christianity has always had with bodies per se. So Christianity has a problem with bodies but that's a particular problem with black bodies. Kelly Brown Douglas, perhaps my favorite womanist theologian, shows how an outworking of Pauline Platonized theology, one that downplays the concrete materiality of the body in favor of the abstracts, the spirit and the soul, was used as a means to demonize black bodies. And to quote Kelly Brown Douglas, she says, accordingly, it is Platonized Christianity that gives rise to Christian participation in contemptible acts and attacks, acts and attacks, sorry, on human bodies, like those of black bodies. Not only does Platonist Christianity provide a foundation for easily disregarding certain bodies, but it also allows for the demonization of those persons who have been sexualized, end of quote. So it's into this long history of black bodies being problematic that we then consider the continuing challenge of Black Lives Matter. Slavery is long gone, but anti-black racism has long outlived the institution that helped to breathe it into life. In our contemporary era, the underlying frameworks of blackness, which still symbolically is seen as representing the problematic other, finds expression in a white police officer placing his knee on the neck of a black man, and despite the plaintive pleas of, I can't breathe, the officer remains unmoved and maintains his violent posture until the black man dies. One cannot understand the futility of this death unless you understand that this is no new phenomenon. White flesh has viewed black flesh as disposable, for the last 500 years. And this is the reason why black theology, of which I'll say a bit more in a moment, came into being simply to assert that our lives mattered in an era where we were viewed purely as chattel and as objects placed on a financial ledger. Black and womanist theologies have focused on the significance of black bodies and they have done so in order to give theological substance to that which has been deemed as other. Anthony Pinn has perhaps been the most significant scholar who has theorised on the significance of the body and the significance of what it means to be in a black body. 
in a world where you are viewed as problematic. This brings me now to perhaps the biggest theological challenge that I want to issue to us this evening, which is about how we think about holiness. I want to rethink how we conceive of holiness and what we mean by being holy. And to be clear, if you take nothing else from this lecture, I'm certain this because I'm arguing that if we imbue black bodies with the sense of preciousness of being set apart, that which is reserved for often inanimate objects like bread and wine and water, that perhaps we may come to see black bodies as being far too valuable to be rendered as valueless and disposable, reduced to an economic equation when juxtaposed with material commodities of worth. Holy is seen as a key characteristic of God. God is worthy of our devotion. The transcendent quality of God is found in God's awesome presence that is determined by God's holiness. When Moses encounters God in the form of a burning bush, Moses is asked to remove his sandals because he is standing on holy ground. The ground itself is not intrinsically holy. The ground becomes holy because it is infused with God's presence. To be identified as holy is to be set apart for God's purposes alone, i.e. holy is not meant to be ordinary. When we identify people as pursuing holiness, we often have images of individuals withdrawing from the world, often leading secluded and separate lives as a means of remaining faithful to and committed to a holy God, i.e. to be holy is often not to be contaminated by the ordinary, the mundane, or the tainted. Holiness is often linked to notions of purity and being without blemish or not tarnished. Often times, being holy or the pursuit of holiness is often characterised by what we do not do as much as what we partake of and partake in. Growing up in the Methodist tradition, there were strict prohibitions against gambling and, drink and drinking. I did not take up drinking alcohol until I had left home to go study at Birmingham University. And even then, for the whole of the first time, I told my mother that I did not drink, which was not true. <laughs> but she didn't need to know what I was getting up to in Birmingham while she was back in our Methodist home in Bradford. That tradition has changed over the years, and the presumption that most Methodists are teetotal no longer seems to be the case. But here's the thing, I still do not gamble. I did buy lottery tickets when the lottery first started, but soon stopped doing so, believing this to be an inequitable tax that fell disproportionately on the poor. Plus, my prevailing sense of incipient Methodist guilt soon got the better of me. I have not bought a lottery ticket for over 30 years. As I've grown older, I've increasingly come to see and been reminded of the Methodist tradition that holiness is a social phenomenon that is embedded in the world, seeking to transform structures and systems for God's purposes as, as opposed to being removed from it. Seeing holy God as connected to the world, seeking to transform it into the likeness of God, requires that those who profess to be committed to God are deeply engaged and embedded in the world. Central to the Christian practice over the years, well, sorry, central to Christian practice, sorry, over the years has been that of Holy Communion. And whatever our different theologies surrounding what we think happens when we pray over bread and wine, what is commonly agreed is that something happens to these ordinary material things. That namely, that namely that we believe that for us, God is amazingly present in the ordinary material things of the world. The whole notion of a sacrament is predicated on the action of God that transforms for us the ordinary and the mundane into the divine presence of God made manifest in and through ordinary matter. Several weeks ago, I was in conversation with my brother, Richard, who was the Director of Justice for Churches Together in Britain and Ireland. I was hoping that he would be here today, but family 
concerns mean he cannot be. As we spoke, Richard made the following observation. He noted how, working in the ecumenical sphere as he does, how schism in the Christian church has occurred over a number of concerns. People have left the church of agenda. Now, by this, when he says people, I'm assuming he meant really white people. Those of a more Catholic persuasion remain unconvinced about women in priestly and Episcopal roles have left the church. People have left over sexuality and certainly left over the sacraments. But to the best of his knowledge, Richard had never heard of any white person leaving the church because of their disgust over racism. Some sins are tolerable at best and of little consequence at worst. Women holding the horse in the Eucharist is intolerable for some. People of the same gender engaging in intimate sexual activity is equally abhorrent. On both accounts, people have left the church. But witnessing hatred towards black people and the concomitant systems of prejudice and power that have marginalised many and silenced them has not resulted in thousands of irate white people leaving the church. In fact, like my brother, I cannot think of one white person who has ever left the church on account of their outrage at the treatment of that institution to their black brothers and sisters. As a black liberation theologian, I'm firmly committed to the belief that God infuses humanity with God's presence, so rendering humanity holy. This is particularly the case for those bodies that have been historically considered as less than, disposable, as chattel, as commodity. If God can transform bread and wine into something special and holy, into a sacrament, then I believe that this God is committed to doing the same for those bodies considered wretched. Black bodies are sacramental. Black liberation theology asserts that black bodies are holy that our dark skin, which has been often marked as out for something to be pitied or attacked, is special. Something through which God's presence is to be found. James Cohn describes this as ontological blackness. A symbolic form of blackness in which God in Christ is revealed through the prism of black suffering. Precisely because God's righteousness is revealed through weakness, through marginalisation, through persecution often indicated by the historic presence of the cross. As James Baldwin once opined, white people discover the cross through reading the Bible, but black people discover the Bible through encountering the cross. Once we believe that despised black bodies are holy, that they are sacramental, then our attitude to black people and indeed to the very concept of blackness must change. This year marks the 30th anniversary of the murder of Stephen Lawrence. 2020 saw the murder murder of George Floyd. In two different contexts, two black men, very different in personalities and life experiences, but in both contexts we see the casual disregard for black bodies. In both contexts we also see how some white Christians are happy to pronounce their commitment to the symbolic power expressed in ordinary elements chased by the actions of a priest, but have no commitment to sentient black bodies that have also been created by God. So this year, as we mark the 30th anniversary of Stephen Lawrence, of his murder, I want us to rethink about the significance of black bodies and their sense of being holy and their sense of being marked out with as much distinction and a sense of being special as we often reserve for inanimate objects like bread and wine. Theologically, I want to argue that God's spirit has infused black bodies so enabling us to become prophetic figures whose presence signals the values of some bodiness for all those who have been cast to the margins as disposable and inconsequential entities. 
In the prologue to John's gospel, it states that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1, 14. Hence the flesh matters. Context, social location and geography matters. Jesus' ministry dwelt amongst the landless poor of Galilee. His movement located itself amongst the artisans far removed from the theocratic centre of Jerusalem. Jesus has more to do with beaten and broken bodies of those deemed irrelevant and disposable than he does with grand monuments to the forces of empire or the white power or with decorated bishops and archbishops crowning an elderly white man of privilege. Black body aligns itself against the structural and systemic forces that stalk the world and says that our bodies matter. Black theology that continues to be the radical rethinking of how we conceive of God in light of the ongoing suffering and oppression of black people in the world run and governed by white people, asserts that this God revealed in Jesus Christ is committed to the liberation and the freeing of black people from racism and oppression. To be clear, there is no holiness that is not social in its implications. There's no way we can be holy in the abstract. Rather, being holy requires us to be connected to the ordinary and the everyday, included and especially committed and connected to those bodies and the people the world considers disposable and of little or no use, unless their value is connected to commodity or they themselves are viewed as commodity. One cannot be considered holy or committed to following a holy God if we believe that asylum seekers, that those people we don't want can be disposed of and sent off to other poor countries because we somehow are too good to take them. I.e. holy is is a deeply political and social enterprise and not a singular and abstract or remote concept. Inanimate objects cannot be considered holy if we do not consider flesh and blood also to be holy, especially black flesh and blood. So as I come to the final section, I want to talk about an embodied pneumatology. If we believe that God's spirit can animate and change the ontological value and status of ordinary things, then black theology believes that God does and continues to renew black bodies. As we think about the murder of Stephen Lawrence and the 30th anniversary, imagine what he could have grown up to be. Imagine all the lives he could have touched, yet he was snuffed out simply because he was born in the wrong skin for some people and his body did not matter. In the narrative to the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 2, if I reread that from a black theological perspective, then what I'm seeing that in verse 22 and 20 to 25, Peter speaks of the means by which Jesus was released from the chains of death in order that a new humanity could emerge. It's my belief that Stephen's death, I hope, will be a, continue to be a catalyst that can and should force us to think about what it means to be British in a way that affirms all bodies, but particularly bodies of black young people. Can the UK, which still carries the scarlet scarlet stains of sin and oppression, that is the collective blood of faceless millions butchered in the name of Christ, can it move to a higher plane to pronounce and renounce that past and embrace a new paradigm for the future? Are we willing to acknowledge the sins of the past? In the great words of James Baldwin, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can ever be changed until it is faced. Is Britain willing to acknowledge its faults in respect of its treatment of black bodies, especially those who are the descendants of enslaved Africans? In the Pentecost narrative, we witness a number of people being transformed and energised by the power of the Holy Spirit. In verse 17, Peter, quoting the words from the prophet Joel, Joel 2, 28 to 32, states, Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. I assume, of course, that this includes young women and old women. 
that the dreams and visions that are bound up with the Acts text are not exclusive to any particular group of people. That the ability to be transformed and to prophesy and to see visions and dream dreams is not, respect, not restricted to any one ethnic group. At the very heart of this God-inspired transformation of human persons is the clear sense of God's love and commitment to diversity and difference. I.e. the ability to have visions and dream dreams as preserve of all humankind. Let me reiterate again, black bodies are holy. The God of all in Christ has called all humanity into an unconditional relationship with the divine. So the need to be inspired, coupled with the possibility of transformation, is the potential that resides within everybody, every human being, within every body, especially within black bodies. So this new centre, this 21st century, is one where we have to be able to acknowledge difference and we have to be able to see the significance of black bodies. So in the last few minutes, I want to outline a very practical way of summation of all of this. I want to recount what is at stake as we think about black bodies, holiness and the transformative nature of God's spirit that continues to inflame and animate and transmute the very nature of matter so that, so that what was once in evidence is changed and is irrevocably made new and holy by the creative dynamism and genius that is God's very self. I was born into a low evangelical Methodist family, where Holy Communion was the Lord's Supper, largely understood as a memorial to what our Lord Jesus Christ had done, without any huge presumption on the part of the majority of the congregation, that it was imbued with metaphysical properties on the part of what happened when the minister prayed over the elements. So for the most part, we took Holy Communion only once a month. And on the occasions when it was celebrated, it was usually after an act of worship and not within it, which meant that the majority of the congregation would go home and not take bread and wine at all. Now, to be clear, I'm not suggesting any of this was normative or even sensible. That's just what we did in Bradford. So once I moved to Birmingham and under, and under and undertook my undergraduate studies in church history, I was soon exposed to a diverse and many different understandings of what holiness looked like, especially within what many were now calling the Eucharist. We never called it that in Bradford, by the way. So by the time I began to work at the Queen's Foundation for Ecumenical Theological Education as a Methodist-funded research fellow, I was aware that there was such a thing as Anglo-Catholics, for whom the host was treated with extreme reverence. So I remember the occasion when I was asked to distribute the wine at a high Anglican service in the Queen's Chapel at which the then Bishop of Birmingham, Mark Santa, was presiding. Suddenly I realised I was running out of wine. A student close by quickly topped up the receptacle into which the wine was being held. Before I could gesture to the next person to come forward, to receive a white Anglican priest moving with the speed and precision of a stealthy panther, leapt in front of the person and issued a prayer over the elements so that they would maintain their properties of holiness, of holy elements. I was somewhat taken aback at his action, not because I disagreed theologically with what he believed he was doing, but more at the speed in which he moved, which to be blunt, looking at his body that was a tad less than athletic, seemed highly unlikely. <laughs> Clearly a great deal was at stake in terms of what should happen to these elements and why his prayer was necessary in order to ensure the holiness of these elements. Seven months later, through a, through a series of events that need not detain us at this juncture, it soon became clear that this same white priest was one who presided over his largely black 
Caribbean congregation with all the grace and subtlety of a colonial apparatchik ruling over backward natives on a so-called mission field in the late 19th century. His racism, arrogance and seeming contempt for the subjectivities of his black congregation was clearly manifest. My dealings with him were invariably fraught and extremely difficult. His congregation respected him as their priest because of their sense of devotion to the Anglicanism in which many of them had been formed back in the Caribbean. A few years later of this initial encounter, he left the church and began for Rome, unable to countenance the existence of women priests in his deanery. At this juncture, I need to acknowledge the intersectionality of all the many bodies that are deemed transgressive by someone like this man. He clearly loved, indeed, he could imbue inanimate objects such as bread and wine with a ferocious devotion that I, as a continued low church nonconformist, post-colonial refusenik, I still don't quite get. But I do respect it. But he could not bring himself to dispense even one ounce of the same devotion to human beings, certainly not to black ones, and certainly not to women. I dare, this, I dare say the same would be thought of as trans bodies had there been greatly in evidence some 20 years ago. If they had been around, he would have despised them as well. So to, re so to reiterate, until we can view all bodies, especially black bodies, as holy, then I refute the notion that anything else can be holy. As a black liberation theologian, I'm never going to countenance mere things as holy, but not sentient holy but not sentient beings, black flesh and blood, black spirit and matter that has been infused and transmuted with the spirit of liberation that is God revealed in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. To reiterate, black bodies are holy, they are sacramental. As we mark the 30th anniversary of the murder of Stephen Lawrence and we continue to live in the shadow of the murder of George Floyd, we are reminded that black lives matter. We are reminded that the ongoing battle to mark bodies, to mark black bodies as holy and beyond capitalistic and materialistic value is an ongoing one. As a Christian theologian, I remain convinced that all lives matter, that all of us are created in the image and likeness of God. But until black lives matter, until black bodies are viewed as sacred, then our talk of holiness and indeed our construal of what is holy remains a form of cheap grace. A blasphemous outrage to the God that created black bodies in the first place and whose presence continues to be revealed most visibly through the lens of those who suffer and are arraigned on contemporary crosses of white supremacy. And there we go. I've just finished. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Reddy, for such a powerful, important and truthful lecture. My name's Ellen Clark King. I'm the Dean of King's College London, and I'm able to host a question and answer session of about 10 minutes. We do have a roving mic that will come round. So if you would like to ask a question rather than give your own mini lecture, then please raise your hand <laughs> and we'll try and take um, two questions at once. While you're thinking, I, um, Professor Reddy, I loved your emphasis on the embodiedness of holiness and especially its embodiedness in black bodies. And I wondered if you could tell us a bit more of what you think a church would look like that really took that seriously. I think one of the clear things that would be different is about how we treat people in the church. I, I, so I'm a cradle Methodist. I've been in church all my life. And, if the truth, and the truth is that oftentimes the most bruising and cruel place I've found people is in the church. 
not outside of it. And for me, if we honestly believe that black bodies were holy, if we, actually if we believed all bodies that we think are transgressive and problematic were holy, if we believe that, that God was revealed as much in them as we believe that, as I said, God is revealed in inanimate in objects, then if nothing else, like we, if nothing else, we would behave better. I've often found, certainly in the church when I was a steward in a particular church, that like you could literally see people arguing amongst each other. And then the minute the minister said, and, and now we will take Holy Communion, and then went through the words, people suddenly kind of pulled themselves up and kind of behaved better. Because that like, we were coming forward to take bread and wine. What would happen if we then just decided that like, we would behave like that in the presence of other people because they, was in, they were important as, as bread and wine was? Our posture to each other would be transformed. In my experience, I'm, no, I'm not a great evangelist. Well, actually, I'm no evangelist at all, quite frankly. But if you speak to most people about why they don't go to church, it's not because they can't handle metaphysics. It's not because they think our doctrines don't make sense. They simply look at us and they say, why would I join that group of people who say they love God, they can't see, but don't seem to love each other in the same room? That would change. Thank you. I see a hand over here, if we could have the mic, and there's one at the back over there as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to know, so I think one of the things um, I noticed with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, political movement, was that there wasn't really any kind of clear um, kind of changes that they were, or requests that they were changing as compared to the civil rights movement. They wanted the you know, end of um, Jim Crow, etc. And I think, um, from my opinion, um, a lot of the challenges that are faced by society racially nowadays tend to be more kind of cultural, things that have been kind of created by institutions in the past, but um, have become deeply um, embedded in our culture. Um, and if you kind of look at the way kind of a lot of black people are presented in the media, it tends to be kind of criminal or um, things like that. And I wanted, so I wanted to know kind of how you think us going back to our own churches or, or workplaces, etc., can kind of help to foster um, cultural renewal and um, develop change culturally. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take that. Yes, one of the most important books I would always encourage people to, uh, to read, they're never my books, by the way, I also encourage people to read other people's <laughs> books. Um, it's a book by Emily Towns, who's one of the leading womanist ethicists, and the book is called Womanist Ethics and the Cultural Production of Evil. Womanist Ethics and the Cultural Production of Evil, Emily, i.e., uh, as supposed to why, Emily Towns. And what Towns says is, uh, she says that one of the problems we have with our Christian theology is that we've been taught to look in the wrong direction for evil. And so a lot of us are looking for some kind of um, um, some metaphys metaphysical being with a pointy tail and a, you know, and a crook. And we're obsessed with sexual ethics and we're obsessed with the minutiae of people's individual lives. But what we miss, she says, is the way in which evil is often embedded in our cultural practices and forms of reproduction, particularly in the media. One thing she invokes is an old aphorism that came from Malcolm X, who said, if you're not careful, the media will teach you to hate the people you should be supporting and loving the people you should be opposing. So our media, we have to have a kind of critical hermeneutic of suspicion that doesn't allow us to get browbeaten into forms of popularism and nationalism that gets us disliking and hating some of the poorest, most marginal people in the world, while some of the richest and most powerful white people of privilege get a pass. So what I think the Black Lives Matter movement has done, and it is a much broader movement, quite diffuse in many respects, has been about getting us to, critique, to critically think about the media and our consumption and the ways in which certain narratives get told in order to reinforce our basic instincts around 
forms of nationalism and popularism that always want to scapegoat a particular group of people. There's always someone to blame. And often it's the people who are the most marginalized and the, the most oppressed. The people that we are called as church to be on the side of. But too often, what we often have is, is a preferential option, not for the poor and marginalized, but a preferential option for the middle class. And I think we have, yes, a question down here. Thank you. Um, thank you for the lecture. Um, I just wondered if you could um, expand a bit on what you said about um, black people finding um, Christianity through the cross. Um, and I've heard you lecture before, um, and you've explained previously the, um, the context that Jesus was living in at the time. I wondered if you might elaborate on that. Thank you. Certainly. So one of the greatest miracles I think we have seen in human history, perhaps it's, it's the most classic one of the miracle of unforeseen consequences, is that when people of African descent were introduced to Christianity, it wasn't done in order because white slave owners were so concerned about our souls, it's because they wanted to make us better slaves. So they invoked things like Paul's teaching in Colossians 3.22 or Ephesians 6.5 to slaves obey your masters. They would endorse the letter to um, Philemon. Where Nisimus runs away but Paul sends him back to his, his, his slave master. It was meant to control us but what black people found long before they could read the Bible for, for hundreds of years slaves were not encouraged to read. It was illegal for a slave to learn to read. So what we were meant to do was to imbibe a, stult, a, stint, a stilted and a distorted version of Christianity that was meant to reinforce our sense of being slaves. But what the slave owners and the more cynical missionaries did not understand was the power of the Holy Spirit that enabled black people to have a sense of the gospel long before we could even read it for ourselves. So therefore, long before we knew what the Bible was, what we knew was what the cross was like. Because the cross was the experience of being on plantations, being treated as chattel, being treated as mere things, but not even things that were worth investing in, you know. I mean, I've got a car and I've learned over the years that if I look after the car, it lasts well. If I trash it, it kind of, you know, uh, goes away to the garage. Well, here's the thing. Such was the disposable nature of black bodies. It was, it was more efficient to run them ragged and kill them within two or three years of brutalizing them through work because there was an endless supply from Africa to bring them in. There was no even, even a sense of how we might invest in the bodies because if we look after them, they would work longer. They didn't even do that. So, so the miracle is that people who were brought to, to Jesus in order to be reinforced as chattel ended up finding through Jesus Christ, a, a God revealed in Jesus who suffered like them at the hands of power and exploitation. They saw in the cross a God who identified with them and their suffering, not the God who was on the side of white hegemony. And that, I think, continues to be the powerful message that black theology seeks to, to teach, that actually there was this dialectical tension as to who we believe God in Christ is. Is God in Christ more at home in this place, in a coronation with powerful white hands putting a crown onto another white powerful head, not saying God is not here. Well, actually, it depends on how it's like you get me to drink as to whether I really think God is here or not. But okay, let me be good, a good ecumenist and I'll say, okay, it's a mystery and we, that something of God is beyond us. Be that as it may, I'm firm in the belief that God is more authentically to be found where suffering and oppression and marginalisation is in evidence than in places like here. Thank you. And that seems like a powerful note on which to um, end. So, Professor Reddy, you began by reflecting on your name and where it came from. 
I had the extremely moving experience in 2020 of visiting the National Lynching Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. And the most powerful and convicting moment for me in that visit was seeing my maiden name, Clark, on one of the memorials. And this isn't because the person who was lynched was in any way a relative of mine, but it was because somebody, some white man who shared my surname had thought that they could own this human being or their parents. Thank you for being willing not only to hold the white church to account, but also to offer us a theological vision for change and for Godward transformation. I believe and hope that your words will stay with us as motivation for action, even more than as matter for reflection. Thank you.